list all the time. Julie is very methodical. She keeps me out in line and chatting. <laughs> she, so we're a good team because we are complete opposites and we love each other and work great together. And so that's a good call. Figure out where you, where you belong and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. I am not good at this stuff and keeping my task. Julie's great at it. <laughs> so um, good call. And, so my wife and I, we have our own nonprofit organization. Okay. We work in the country of Burma and Myanmar. Okay. Oh, um, wow. Cool. Orphanage homes, we do preventative work, and we've rescued some children. Oh, very good, very good. Very good. Nationals. Okay, good. Wow, good. Um, so you were visiting here, or you, or you go back and forth? We, we go back and forth. We'll next be there in January. Okay. Um, but it would be really good to for us to... Um, you know, get people on board here in yeah, the U.S. And sure. to teach them more, mm -hmm. and maybe form a task force or, or you know something. I don't know a task force, but maybe a, at least a group that can advocate here sure. for knowledge mm -hmm. and for and know, how to spread awareness and education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Adrian College has an amazing task force. Um, not for sale. Not for sale. They partner with Not for Sale. Mm -hmm. And they have a strong, huge task force. College campuses would be a great place for you to start. They do it. They do amazing work. I'm sure you guys do too at school. Cool. Cool. And it, it is a, it is a, it's a it's, it has to catch on. It has to be something that grows. Because when I first uh, started with Adrian College, I think it was like five students. And how many you guys have now? We're growing. I'm not sure of the last count, but. Definitely the double Find new rooms. Now. Yeah, yeah, they have to find more room. They're they're growing and it's got and they've done some amazing stuff. So that would be a great place for you to um, look too, just because of the, the students are like they work hard and they're ready to learn more and they want to help and they and they think much more globally yeah. than the older generations. They do. And this would be great for the two of you maybe to talk yeah. at some point yeah. about what sure. your organization has done and yeah. what, you know, share yeah. ideas and that yeah. sort of thing. So we're new yeah. this year. So oh, we mm -hmm. got approved at the end of last year. Okay. And we're like, okay, cool. So we're like, now what? Yeah. We sort of spent the whole summer sort of like bringing up stuff. Mm -hmm. And then school year, you know, we're trying to, you know, get stuff going and mm -hmm. realize, okay, we really don't have that much money. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, do all these big things, are trying to figure out what's the most effective way to be doing things, but that's still making a real difference and not just making us feel good about right. ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're just kind of at a standstill right now trying to figure out what direction do we need to be going because we really, uh, I'm an inter international development major, so I'm very aware of, you know, you can think you're doing really good things. Really hard on people. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm just, I'm so weary to just like go jumping in with something. I want to like truly like think yeah. everything out and be like, okay, is this actually truly the best decision with you know few people we have involved? You know, we don't have hundreds of okay. students. We have twenty. Yeah. So you know, that's, that's great though. Yeah. Twenty is a great start. Yeah. So I mean, we, we have a lot. Seven of us are actually here today. That's very fantastic. They're kind of spreading out to the different workshops. Yeah, so we're, we're actually hitting everyone. We all oh, wow. we all took up and we're all going to be taking notes and then sharing. Cool. But yeah, so it's it's a struggle, but we'll get there. Yeah. Well, a task force. I mean, it starts as an idea. Um, I can tell you a little bit about me. I was in the Navy. I um, was aboard a ship. I got to travel all over the world, and we pulled into Turkey, and I found out that Turkey. This is a while ago, and they don't do it anymore, so I don't want to date myself, but um, Turkey had government-run brothels, and where, so you're aware, and I was very upset to learn that it was a hot spot for the Navy. You know, I was on a ship of 300 some people, and only 30 of us were females. The rest were all males, so when they pull into port, we 30 females aren't sitting with the males, so they go there. <laughs> and, so um, I was I was very offended by that, and I hated it. And I ran around the ship, I'm like, what if it were me? What if we get in trouble while we're out on liberty, and they take me? And you know, I was like, in everybody's face, freaking out about this. But I was young, and I was kind of dumb, and I didn't have a voice yet. I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, stuff like that. Um, fast forward a few years, um, my, my whole family is in law enforcement in some aspect or another, and um, my dad got invited to 
um, meet with some of the Adrian Dominican, my old police chief, where we're from. Got invited to meet with some of the Adrian Dominican sisters. And we have a big group of the Dominican sisters that for home port is in uh, where we're from. And they started the trafficking and they kind of gave me my voice and I have some amazing mentors in those women. They are just amazing, outstanding women. And, and they do many great things to change the world. Anyway, that's how I got started. That sparked me to, and I've been all over teaching, learning, speaking about this. So that's where, that's where I got started. So just one little thing that, you know, in the back of your mind, or one little thing that sparks your interest or whatever, it ignites some passion in you to do something. Um, so we're going to go, Julie's going to go over some basic stuff um, about the task forces and, and where they are and who, who, there's tons of them. And we didn't list all of them, we're going to list some main ones for you or tell you about some main ones. So. Yeah, we don't even have, that's one of the struggles is that we, there's not like a central website yet that lists everybody. So that kind of, with contact information and everything like that. So that's one of the things I feel like the Michigan State Task Force needs to start working on. Um, but just to give you a sense of sort of how, it's sort of this hierarchical structure, right? So there is a federal task force that our federal government runs, um, but then the state level task forces are not actually part of the government. They're just, they're run by whoever, you know, wants to start them up at the state level. So the Michigan, when I say Michigan Human Trafficking Task Force, that's not actually a part of the government of the state of Michigan. Um, now there are, there are like senators and, <clears throat> and representatives that work on those issues, but there's not like a, a government sponsored state trafficking task force. Um, the Michigan Human Tra Task Force is housed at the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University in East Lansing. Jane um, White runs that, you're gonna yeah. her later today. Jane she's White, talking. she's one of the key keynote speakers. I think the first one after the workshops. Um, <clears throat> so there's over 90 member agencies um, citizens, regional task forces, um, like the Adrian Dominican Sisters is a member agency. Um, all of these folks, um, you know, a lot of them attend the state task force meetings and all that. FBI, ICE, all those yeah. agencies are, are, are from there. Yeah. Zonta, the women's business organization. I can actually get your email addresses at the end of this and send you this, if, if that would be helpful. That way you don't have to like write down every single word up there. Um, okay, so we've got the federal level, and there are like national organizations as well, like the Polaris Project, for instance. There's a lot of sort of national organizations, but the, but um, at the state level, we just have the Michigan Task Force. Okay, so then underneath the state level, we've got the regional task forces, and then underneath that, we've got the local. Um, so regional task forces are usually multi-county. So counties in one specific region of the state come together and partner with each other and share resources and all of that. And then the local task forces would be like your single county or like a city or township. Um, or even, you know, maybe a university or something like that. Um, so. Our region is Lenoy, Jackson, Monroe, no, yeah. Yeah. Monroe and Hillsdale counties. Yep. And then locally we have like a, we have the Lenawee County uh, Human Trafficking Task Force, Adrian College has one, Julie's studying one at Siena Heights, so there's smaller parts of that, and then each of those counties have task forces and we work, all work together regionally as well. Right, so they would all, they would all meet, like Hillsdale County meets, Lenawee meets separately, Jackson, Monroe, they all meet separately, and then every three months we all come together for a Southern Michigan Regional Task Force meeting and share ideas and all that. So these are just some of the regional task forces in Michigan. Again, like I mentioned earlier, even like at our state task force level, we don't have a list of all of them. Um, so Southern Michigan is the one we were just talking about. That's the one we're a part of from Lenawee County. Um, there's a Southwest Michigan task force. There's a Great Lakes region, which I think is like the Saginaw Bay City Midland task forces. And then I know there are other ones, but I think there, there might be one in the Upper Peninsula. I think there's five or six of them now regionally. And it's something new that the state task force has started. So I know that they're, they're in the process of changing their website and getting this up and running. So it'll be a good resource for what you. What website would we go to to find out if there's one in our area? Um, the state, the Michigan, the state of Michigan Human Trafficking Task Force. Okay. The Michigan, it's called the Michigan Human Trafficking Task Force. Yeah, you just, I don't know the exact website right on hand, but. Yeah, you can just Google it. Yeah, it'll pop right up. Yeah. 
But like I said, it might not be listed, even if there is one in your county. Well, they're probably That's prep, that's something that because they, I believe they'd be like here as where they would group up with them. So then the local level, we mentioned the four that are part of our region, and then I know there's one in Kalamazoo, and then I'm learning about some other ones today that I wasn't aware of. Um, and like, it, like we said, there's, there's many more than this, but those are the ones that I could find on the Michigan website. Um, okay, so, so that's sort of the hierarchy of all the, all the task forces and how they work. How they work. Um, and we're going to kind of both of us chat with you just about how to form one, or if you've already got one going, like the student organizations, for instance, thinking about who you might want to partner with or other ideas of who you could get involved in your particular task force. Um, so the first thing is what, just what do you need to get started? And I think everybody in this room already has a passion for this issue in some way, shape, or form where you wouldn't be here today. Um, you already realize it's a problem, it's a growing problem, and you are already taking the steps to try to help work and fight against it. Um, and then I think it's just a matter of partnering, finding other people to, that have the same passion as you, that want to help with this issue, and coming together and starting to brainstorm. Um, so we also, you know, just sort of brainstorm some ideas of who to who you might want to invite. And Kelly made a good point about this the other day. She's basically she basically said like there really aren't very many people you want to exclude. The question is not who should you invite. It's why would you not invite everybody? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we all have a, a, an intrinsic worth to uh, dedicate toward this. You know, we, we talk about um, schools have to be on the lookout. Why, why would we invite the electric companies? Because they're on poles and they can see everywhere, you know? Why would we invite the building inspectors? Because they go into these buildings and they see if something doesn't look right, it's probably not right, you know? And so, uh, Zanta has money to help you with your stuff. Um, women's shelters um, need to be educated and taught. There's no reason to invite everybody. Uh, and, and when we talk about performing goals, we, all of the people have something to contribute to your specific role, whether it just be your, your educating people. We need to educate all those people, so every goal you have, everybody should be included in that goal in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, and even thinking about like different business leaders, um, like hotels, for instance, could be crucial in helping identify when human trafficking is taking place. If they're not involved. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, you have to be, I mean, you can, you, you can tell pretty quick. You can go in there and observe, sit in the lobby and observe for a few minutes and start to figure things out pretty quick when you know about stuff and when you start to know what to look for. Um, are they going to let you put any pamphlets in their box? No, they're not. And a lot of hotels have laws against that, especially big ones, but... Um, it's usually not so much a hotel that is running that as it is are people running out of the hotel. Um, so that's why we educate the hotel staff. That's why we say, can we come in and do a presentation to your staff on, on human trafficking and what they should be looking for? And let's get you guys numbers, you know, phone numbers and resources to call, things like that. So it's always, we can get you some pamphlets that you, your people can keep on your desks so that you know what to look for. And one of the things, we are going to mention this later in what we've done, one of the things we've done as a task force, but um, have any of you heard of Teresa Flores and the, the soap, soap project? project. Oh, yeah. yeah. She does the soap stuff. I mean, she takes mm -hmm. that all over. And they have a hard time getting that in hotels because hotels are very, have very strict rules about their soap. And um, so, but uh, a great place for that soap is like um, gas stations, um, the rest stops, things like that. Even the smaller, the hotels that aren't necessarily chains, I think, are oftentimes because they're cheaper, like the roadside motels where you just they'll walk right up to the door. They don't want to buy the soap themselves, we just bring right. it to them for free. You know? And she does training sessions, like she does training. I went to one in January for the Detroit Auto Show where we all went through a training session and then we went out to hotels and went to the front desk staff with bags of soap and said, can you put this in the rooms on these certain dates? And it, you know, it's got the, the human trafficking um, 800 number on it in case there's a big number. Does everybody know that number? 
a little bit of extended lunch break once a month, and it's no big deal if they have like, like an eight to five job or something. Um, and then we have some folks who don't have you know a typical eight to five job, and they can make that work with their flexible schedule. So it really just depends on you know who you're working with, and you know some task forces meet in the evenings on weeknights, maybe some on Sundays, whatever works. Um, how to set goals and accomplish them? You want to tackle that one? This way is a hard no, topic too, because everybody has goals or ideas. Mm -hmm. So what do we? You know, it's all about prioritizing what's the most important thing in your community. Usually, education is first. It's most important to educate your community. Um, so that's usually one of the first goals um, that we have. Um, we, uh, one of our trafficking cases happened to be a massage parlor uh, opened up in Lowey County. It took us a year to get that thing closed, um, but changing law. So we um, are, we have an idea that we want to, and I think Jeremy's working on it around here. Um, we want to make a law so that a massage parlor can be open 24 hours. Who goes and gets a massage at 3 a.m., you know? Nobody. Um, so that they have set hours and they, you know, in, in Michigan, the whole state, Michigan does not have a massage therapist does not have to be licensed. A cosmetologist has to be licensed. Um, a person that does facials has to be licensed. But a massage therapist does not have to be licensed. And why is that? Because we can fix a lot of this with a license. You know, you have to have some training, you have to get a license. In the state of Michigan, you don't have to have that. So those are some things that like we're working on too. But everybody has an idea, and how do you harness all those ideas and prioritize them? And, and it's difficult. So um, we kind of um, we like our, right now we are planning our next year, our, our year. So we want to make a big splash in January. It is a uh, human trafficking month, so we want to make a big splash in January. So like our last meeting, I said let's bring ideas next month. We're gonna make some plans, and that's one of our things is we want to make a big splash in the community because I feel like we've been backpedaling a little bit lately. We've lost our momentum, and we got to get that going again. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, um, one thing. I also want us to start learning more all the time, so I've asked our group to volunteer to do a presentation. So somebody from our group is doing a presentation on some fact. Um, last month, I gave one on the over-sexualization of, of women. Um, that's a huge factor in um, human trafficking because we sexualize sex trafficking for us to sell our story, right? Many times, sex trafficking victims can't uh, not believe they're a sex trafficking victim because they don't identify with the pictures that we're flashing on TV. You know, so are we hurting each? Are we hurting our cause? Or are we helping our cause? Those are, so those are some things that we need to learn about, and talk about all the time. So learning about that, each each meeting we have a small section set aside to learn something new. So how do we, and then we got to prioritize our goals. We're going to have to like vote on the goals and what we're going to accomplish this year. And if we don't get it accomplished next year, we keep it and try to accomplish it the next year. And there's so many, there's so many layers to that onion. There's so many goals we have to accomplish, you just kind of got to prioritize. And, and, and then the means you have, what can you accomplish with the means that you have. Right. So goals are difficult. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of it just depends on your organization. If you're at a university, for instance, obviously, like every year, you have to re-educate a whole new class of students, right? Um, so that's like a constant, um, a constant goal that you. But I think every organization, education and awareness, I think is one of the biggest issues because you have new membership, you have new people in the community. That's always a really, really important one. Um, Okay, so spreading awareness about your organization and trafficking in general, there's a bunch of different ways that you could do that. Um, just trying to be more visible in the community is a really important way to do that. So if your county has a fair, for instance, get a booth and have some flyers or just have your, you know, have your number available as a person who can you know, be contacted for information. Um, set up a website, set up a Facebook page. Social media is huge. Yeah, social media is huge. Tweet, tweet, and tweet it, tweet it, yeah. Twitter it, tweet it, tweet it. Tweet it out. <laughs> oh, see, <I'm> <laughs> yeah, but, um, and, and those are some ways that you can get just general information out there about your organization. Put a little blurb in your local newspaper that, hey, there's this new organization. Anybody interested, come to our first meeting. Or oh, my friend. Like, 
your newspaper's photographer. <laughs> yes. Call your friends with the newspaper's photographer and then call them the day before and say, hey, we're doing this, we need you to come, mm -hmm. take picture, and get in the paper. Yep, and, and then anytime time we do... We, that we exploit ourselves. Yes. <laughs> anytime you do anything, if you bring in a speaker, let your local news organizations know about it. Maybe, the t maybe your local TV station will show up or your newspaper. Or even if you just have a little, like, like the town where I grew up, Chesney, St. Charles, Michigan, there's a, there's not, a, you know, the Saginaw News was the closest one, but that's like 45 minutes away, no one's going to come. But we had a little tri-county citizen that would cover, you know, the more local events that were happening in the city. So, you know, just think about all those different resources. And once you set up that Facebook page or whatever you're going to do, make sure that your organization likes a bunch of others, and maybe they'll like you back, and then, you know, get that word out there on Facebook, you know, invite all your friends to like your page, and it just spreads from there. Yeah, so I think Facebook and Twitter would be great ways to get, get that information out there. Um, and then just trafficking in general, you know, once people are aware of your organization, they're going to listen. Hopefully most people will at least give you an initial listen. Um, and, you know, and then you can spread awareness about trafficking in general by doing some of the things I mentioned, like bringing in speakers if you have the resources to do that, um, you know, flyers at fairs, any, uh, any other ideas that we've done to spread awareness. Um, Are there a final one in C3 thing when you do this, or how? You will, that's like, yeah, this, it gets tricky when we we'll, we'll talk about funding and resources okay. in our next thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you will need, if you are going to collect money in any way, shape, or form, you are going to have to have that or have a partner that has it. So we, I always this always sound we run all our money, we launder our money. We run it all through the Adrian Dominican Sisters, um, give us a huge grant every year, a big one, and so we're very lucky. Yeah, we are lucky, huge that lucky that we have that resource. So we have, and, and they keep our money in. And they run, we run all our money through them. They like do all our money. So they have the final one. I know it's free C, right? Mm -hmm. I know it's there. So we have that. Colleges, you have that capability as well. But um, if you're going to start a local task force, you're, you're going to need to do that. So if you have Zanta in your area, I saw you have a Seroptimist um, card. Those, things, those groups have those, okay. so if they will sponsor your task force, you can do that. Your money can go through them. So there's ways to get around that, because um, it's difficult to get those, and it's expensive, and things like that. You're probably going to have to hire an attorney, things like that. But sometimes those groups will be your sponsor for that. So it, your task force will be run through Zonto. Mm -hmm. So you have to see if you can partner up with some people like that. Mm -hmm saves a little time and energy. And then once your task force gets bigger and you have a lot of members and you're rolling, then you can get your own. You know, when you have some funding, et cetera, you can get your own. But to start, I would, a church, you know, a lot of them are run through their churches. There's a lot of church groups that have done them and, you, can, you know, financially you can do that through the churches, nonprofit. So there's, a, there's, there's avenues where you have to get your own. So. Um, and then partnering with other task forces in the state, other local or regional task forces, or the state task force. Like we mentioned at the beginning, it's a little bit difficult just because, right now, just because it's not all out there available at your fingertips for who to contact. But um, the Michigan State Task Force website is a really good place to start. Um, and then conferences like this, like it's great that everybody's here because you can hopefully network with people, find others who are in your area that might um, have a task force that's already going or a regional task force that you can kind of partner up with. Um, and yeah, just kind of going from there, starting, you know, starting with the ones that you're aware of. Um, and then, you know, you could always, we'll give you our email addresses at the end, and you could always email us and say, hey, do you know of a task force in northern Michigan that maybe we can partner up with? Yeah. Um, the state, like I said, is redoing their website. Um, so that will, I'm going to write mine down. This long. I have a long name. Oh. Can you read my handwriting? Kelly A. Kelly A. Maria at Gmail. All over? Yeah, yeah. Which 
tool is more than willing to answer any questions you have when it comes to helping build up the task force, stuff like that. Any questions about this, we're more than willing to. I think something funny I learned though too. It's if you have an out of town speaker come in, I, you may know more about trafficking than me, but having an out of town speaker come in, like people listen. If I go to speak in my own hometown, people don't listen as well. If I bring somebody from somewhere else, I oh, I'm bringing this person in, and they're, they must be they're like, oh, you yeah. yeah, know a lot. But <laughs> you know, you've been doing this for how many years? But you know, it's funny how that works. Yeah. So that's a great thing. We partner up with different um, task forces or the state. You know, I have friends that have task forces all over the state, and we have the state task force. So I'll bring somebody from there. I have a friend that's uh, in the FBI, and she's a, a victim advocate for the FBI. Well, I'm a victim advocate too, but because she works for the FBI, so it's just like, oh, she works for, what? She works for the FBI, and I like think, you know, she's a movie star. Mm -hmm. That's pretty funny, but yeah, everybody wants to come hear her talk. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have no problem exploiting her as well. <laughs> Yeah, and if, um, I can also send you, like, for instance, we just had a, a Southern Michigan regional meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I could send you our minutes, and you could look over, okay, here's the things that this regional task force is doing. It's like a three-page single space <laughs> list of minutes of things we presented on and things. Kelly and I went to a couple of conferences in Florida over the summer and learned a lot, so we presented on that to our, to our task force. And, um, that's another thing you can look for. Obviously, you're at a conference right now, but there's, there's some bigger ones um, at different places around the state, like the University of Toledo just had one a couple weeks ago, Human Trafficking, Prostitution, and Sex Work Conference. Um, it was two days, and there were tons of speakers. It's a huge one. Oh my God. Yeah, so... I, that I, calendar for next year, yeah, every year. It's like um, mid-September. Yeah, it's a huge Every year. It's really big. They had speakers coming from all over the country, and they also had like four international speakers that came in, too, from different parts of the world. It was, it was yeah, incredibly very, uh, useful. Celia Williams um, is a, a social work professor at UT, and she has been a huge voice in human trafficking for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and she she, I, I will go, I've been doing this for years, and I will go set through her human trafficking one on one every time and learn a ton from her. Did, you what know, her Cecilia Williamson. Williamson. I think it's Williams. 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 And are the, are the state and regional task force meetings open to anyone? The state task force, you have to become a member, which you can um, you get on the website, you send somebody an, an email or whatever, you come to it, and we go. You, it's not like we, we don't vote everybody in, but if you are you know trying to if you're starting to build a task force, we want we want to help you. We want you to help us. So it's not. I mean, they do a little bit of background check on you. So they, because we do have FBI, ICE, like all those people are heavily involved in this, and we do talk about some pretty sensitive things. And um, so we do a little bit of a background check on you to make sure you're not a you know, trafficking felon. You know, we don't want to do <laughs> It was a huge top, it was a huge, yeah. it was funny. We usually, so I'm a victim advocate, and so usually people like me and law enforcement don't get along because I'm like the kind of gentler person, and they're like, oh, I'm going to interrogate the victim, and I'm like, no, you're not talking to my victim like that. You know, it's like we kind of, um, and, and for some reason, then the state task force, we're not, we get along very well. And we had a topic come up where some of the counselors said that human traffickers, perpetrators of trafficking or whatever that have been reformed, um, we think we should bring them into our task force to teach us. And it was like a parting of the Red Sea. Yeah, <laughs> the cops, and I actually, I am a little bit, I was raised by well, my whole family's in law enforcement, so I was like, oh no, no, I, I gotta draw the line somewhere. We cannot, you know, it was funny, because they wanted to learn from sure. them, and the cops were like, once you did it, you have always gonna do it, they're not, you know, they're not reformed, they're not, like, it, was, it was pretty funny, so. But um, yeah, so we have to be, we are a little bit careful about who comes in. But, but yeah, I'm, it's definitely open. Regionally, um, I'm not, where are you from? Jackson. Jackson. Oh, so you can come to our regional meeting. Um, and, and there's, we have people um, from, that come from Jackson. Yep. 
Um, our last slide was, we've already covered a lot of this, I think, things that we've done, who we've partnered. Obviously, we are Lenawee County Task Force as a part of the regional one, so we've partnered with the three other counties that are members of that. We, you know, obviously, we also partner with the state task force. We've had people, we usually every, how often are the state task force meetings? Once a month. The second Wednesday of every month. So usually we have one member of our regional task force, at least, if not our county one, that goes to the state meetings. Um, we brought in speakers from all over. Um, as we mentioned, we've attended a few different conferences. We're up to, well, four now, at least. Um, there, and the Michigan State tra or Trafficking Conference is in November, right, at Michigan State University. Yes, that it's right. in the minutes. If, I, if you send me an email, I'll send you the minutes. I think it's November, like, oh, 11th. Don't quote me on that. I want to say November 11th, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and then just ways that we've um, spread awareness or educated people about trafficking through our task force. Um, we've had Teresa Flores come in a couple of different times. I brought her in as a, as a my, through my position at Siena Heights University. I brought her in um, to speak to the campus, and it was amazing. I thought, I, I had it in this auditorium that holds a couple hundred people, and I thought, oh, I'm thinking 60 or 70 students might show up for this. There were 250 students there. They were all over the floor, sitting up on a stage next to her. It was incredible. Um, and people talked about it at my school for weeks afterwards, and they still bring it up once in a while. It was like two years ago. Um, and then the, the Dominican sisters brought her in to speak as well at a community setting. I think it was at a high school. Um, at the, at the center, yeah, and it was really well attended as well. So just bringing in speakers, spreading awareness like that, and some of the other <laughs> techniques I've talked about, like we've gone to the fair, or we've done, um, we try to put things in our newspaper and, and stuff like that. One of the members called the local radio station, and they had us, like one of the guys on the radio does a uh, question and answer, like time thing, we went in, and. He asked us all kinds of questions about human trafficking and stuff. We answered them, we recorded it, and he played that a couple nights um, for free. So, yep, if you just contact them and ask them if there's anything that they can do, like, do you have any educational segments? We'll, we'll teach you about this. Um, do you have any free advertising for you know not these nonprofit things? And, and it, it may not go until you know between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., but you know, somebody might be up in the middle of the night listening to the radio. That's right. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions about anything? Questions for us or ideas you want to share with each other? Well, I do have a question. Um, a friend of mine works for the health department. She had a girl and a man come into the health department, and the girl just stood there staring at the floor. The man did all the talking. Yeah, that's a huge red flag. Okay? Yeah. But because of HIP laws, her hands are pretty much tied. What could she have done? What she, could she do? She, he doesn't have to be in that room. She could have asked him to step out if they needed to speak to her. Um, if she if she's not saying anything, she's probably not going to fight too much. I mean, she may he may give her the evil eye. Before. I mean, getting them to speak is a huge getting a, a trafficking victim to speak up is is a huge problem we have. Um, I like feel like I'm plugging the guy across the hall, but if you go talk to the prosecutor or you go listen to him talk, um, he has very different ideals about like safe harbor laws and things like that because it so do do we question her and badger her until she says something or how do we how do we deal with her in the right way do we take a, a human trafficking victim and do we talk to them and do we teach them or do we make them tell us like the safe harbor law makes it so they don't have to talk to us or participate if they get in charge of prostitution like a child that is a child should not be charged with prostitution, right? You know, but do we charge them with prostitution and say help? But we know they're being trafficked, but help us, and then we'll get rid of these charges. Like the safe harbor law, and it's kind of a the safe harbor law says you can't do that. You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword for law enforcement because they have no leverage then, and people don't. You know, I, I work in I I'm a crime victim advocate for the prosecutor's office, so I see like domestic violence, which is often Human trafficking will be found through domestic violence. You know, they, 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 they don't want to talk, they don't want to participate, they want you to drop charges, you know. And what do we do? 
we tip, we, we say we're not driving charges and we put them on a stand to testify and they're like, oh, you know, what do you do? So there's a, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult getting a victim to speak. Oftentimes they need some therapy before they'll even tell you anything. So you have to tread lightly. You have to befriend them. She has to talk to her. She has to be kind to her. And hopefully if you didn't get her that time, that she remembers her and she remembers they were kind to her there. And the next time she comes in, she might be ready to speak. You know? Yeah, I'll tell you the, the hardest thing for me as a crime victim advocate was, you know, the first, I am a huge feminist. I was a naval firefighter. I hate, I, can't, I hate it when guys like me, women, or even vice versa. I can't stand it. And, and then the women are like, I, I can't talk. I can't, you know, and I'm like, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> you know, and then oh, I'm all feisty. And they're, they're not like that, you know. So I, have a, I had a hard time relating to them. Are you going to let him just beat you? No, you got to do something, you know? And it's not like that. And I, it's not like that. And it's really hard to start to relate to them. And it took me a long time to be like, okay, well, when you're ready, I'm here. When you're ready to do this, I'm here. So the next time, you know, the average woman, it takes her being beaten five to seven times before she's ready to speak, before she's ready to say, yes, let's do this, let's do this, let's prosecute them. So that was a hard lesson for me to learn. And um, it, Trafficking is the same way. You're not going to get them every time. You're probably not going to get them the first time. Some of those perpetrators threaten their victims, you know, if you ever say a word to anybody, I'll kill your family, etc. Mm -hmm. Just horrible threats like that. So it's hard to yeah. get someone to speak up when they're, when they're under that kind of threat. This, it's a crazy thing. We had, like, we learned this um, in one of our conferences we were at. They, the pimps, for lack of a better term, whatever, will um, hire or will sell their girls on the street in the exchange of a uh, post shift. So the money is not in the house where the activity is happening. They exchange the poker chip for the girl in the house then, so there's no money linked to that. So if that place is ever raided, there's not the money there. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if we raid a house of prostitution, we confiscate everything. We take all the money. So they learned that for us not to get their money, they do the money exchange somewhere else. It's crazy stuff. We, you know, on um, Backpage, anybody been on Backpage? Oh, it's crazy. You look on Backpage and they're selling girls and they'll say she's 13 roses and, and 45 skittles. That means she's 13 years old and she's $45. You know, like how they do that stuff and get away with it. And Facebook and, there, and then Skittles and Roses are not the only terms they use, but it's well known in that community what those terms are. Pimpology is a book on Amazon. You can get on Amazon right now and order it, and it teaches you how to be a pimp. What's it called? It's called Pimpology. <laughs> I love Amazon. I shop on Amazon all the time, but I really don't like the Amazon sells that book, so I write them letters all the time. Right, Amazon letter and it's all It's inappropriate. Yeah, just one of the things that kind of came to me, and just again, kind of going through where we're at, and, and just listening today and yesterday is, you know, we talk about prevention, intervention, aftercare, and then, you know, in my own mind, there's the whole legal aspect of it too. But have you guys thought of it in those terms, and do you do you organize activities in those different areas? Uh, or are you um, are you focused more in one area than another? We focus more on prevention. Um, well, we, well, we have members from everything. So, like, we have law enforcement members that are there in, in like during doing interventions. Yeah, interventions. Yeah. You know, we, me as I am not going to do intervention. I'm not trained to do intervention, and I don't suggest anybody do intervention until you're trained. Um, and that better, better mean you better be a police officer or something like that because it's very, very, very dangerous. And uh, so intervention is best left to the people that know. Yeah, the best thing you can do is call that 800 yeah. number. If you, you see, see it, your, your intervention would be yeah. called, or call 911. If it's something happening right now in your city, you can call 911. But I would also call the Polaris Project because they keep track of that. And they will let you know, and they'll call your city as well, and then they will let you know the aftermath of that, too. You can tell them, I want to know what happened, and they will keep tabs of that for you. That's what I wondered what they mm -hmm. do. 
So they call like if you are in a yeah if you are in a uh, a truck stop. truck stop and you see something funny, you can call Polaris Project. Because I mean, you can call 911 too. Right. But if you see something funny, the Polaris Project will call all the local law enforcement, whoever they, they know exactly who to call for. That many big cities have a human trafficking task force in their police departments, and so they can call that directly. You know, it's so it's a good thing if it's local and you see a girl being. Traffic's right in front of you, and you know your local police force. You can call 911 and say, "This is so and so. I have this happening right here, right now." You know, and you'll you'll probably get a response faster than calling that number first. I know Truckers Against Trafficking. Yeah, it's an really awesome organization. Really encourages you to call the federal task force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know what they say is you don't know when local law enforcement might get there and mm -hmm. have the demand. And I say call necessarily. I say call everyone. Call, call the sheriff. Call everybody. Don't and don't be afraid. And everybody. You one, one, wrong. Yeah, one question I get all the time is, you know, I saw a girl in the bathroom and she was brushing her teeth and she was washing her hair in the bathroom, and, but I don't know. And then I said it's better to be wrong than to be right and let her go, right? I don't. They may be annoyed, but that's their job. And they all, they all, they may gripe and complain because you called them and you were wrong. But that's their job, and they know it. And they're not gonna be mad at you because you called and you were wrong. Because in the end, you, one time somebody's gonna be right, and it will be all worth it, right? So it's better to be call and be wrong than to not call and have been right. So there's a number that truck drivers can. Yeah, there's a whole organization called Truck Tat. Yeah. yeah, Truckers Against Trafficking. It's a huge organization. It's really it's cool. Down there. Yeah, have her look up Truckers Against yeah. Trafficking. They have stickers they put on their trucks yeah. now. Yeah. See if her um, trucking organization is a member of it. Yep, they 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 do all and they well the best been, eyes. <laughs> her and her husband do it together. Yeah, and they've been approached by they call them hot lizards. Yeah. yeah, and they put that on the, yeah they put that on their truck and what lizards. And unfortunately, those are young girls. Usually, those are under 18 years old, and, it, and it's that's a really sad case. There's a great video on their website about a truck driver that called in when he saw girls, young, really young girls, being trafficked at a truck stop. And that and happened right here on the 75. It was in Toledo. Yeah, Toledo, they, they were the they were kidnapped, and mm -hmm. they were being trafficked at truck stops. Yeah, if you go on the web, it's an awesome video to watch. And he rescued his call, like, rescued them and broke open like a multi-state trafficking ring. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. uniquely yeah. yeah. positioned to, yeah. right. yeah. yeah. to be in the right place. Mm -hmm. But you kind of, I guess you answered my question already, but um, I'm from Grand Rapids, this is a big city. Yep. And you go driving down um, 28. There is a massage parlor in this and the windows are all blacked out. And I've kind of been thinking, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. If I call that number, what's going to well, happen? You can call it, and they're going to call your local, your local, your local law enforcement agencies. They're going to check on it. They're going to say, Do you know about this? What do you think? You know, they're going to okay. okay. bring it to their attention. Chances are they already know about it. Like I told you, it, yeah. we live in Little Adrian, and it took us a year to shut ours down. Yeah. Because you got to catch them. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta do a sting up. I mean, it's a, yeah. you gotta oh, observe yeah. forever. You gotta, it took us a year to shut ours down, so it takes a while. Chances are they know what's there, and they're just trying to figure out how to shut it down. But if you're calling and the public starts calling mm -hmm. and saying they're gonna, you know, it's pressure on them okay. to get it done quicker. But yeah, because I, because I see that number all the mm -hmm. time, and I never yep. knew. Okay, like what happens when I. Yep. And I don't want to just call and be like, hi, I'm just testing this out. Yeah, we got mm -hmm. Hey, we just want to know what's going on today. <laughs> yeah, how's your day? Yeah, yeah. yeah, for lunch. Um, okay. This man 24 hours a day? Yeah. Yeah, call anytime. Okay. You know, where, I'm, where I live, the uh, I uh, 127 corridor meets 75. Mm -hmm. And that is like the hub. Right yeah. there. There, there's cops everywhere usually, and they're usually state boys. But I don't understand why they don't have some kind of a sting thing going on. Because you know, I mean, they've got to go to Traverse City that way. Mm -hmm. They've got to go to Sheboygan that way, or, you know, all that whole area over there. I don't understand why they don't have some kind of a sting operation to pull people over just out of the blue. You can't. You have to have cause. Well, say, for instance, their license plate's dirty. I mean, that's cause. Well, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
But, but you gotta have a, but you don't want a bad you don't want a bad stop to throw out a big case. So if it's a bad yeah. stop and they you know you never know. Yeah. Trust me, things I say working in working in the judicial system is like waking up on Christmas Day and finding out there's no Santa and you got no presents. <laughs> it's like that bad. It's like what we you know they say we live in Anyway County, the cops will get you any way they can. <laughs> That's not true. Like, we, you know, you'd be surprised how many things that we have to let go because we don't have probable cause. Yeah. You know, yeah. things like that. So, it's, and, and there's a whole mindset when, it, when we talk about sex trafficking, when we talk about prostitution, there's a whole mindset of, um, that we're, we're, there's a paradigm shift here. We're changing the way people think, you know. And, Generations older than me think that people, you know, prostitutes the oldest, you know, living profession. You know, profession. Yeah, I mean, profession. Yeah, because you know, I know plenty of five-year-olds that aspire to be a prostitute when they get older. No, that's not what people aspire to be. It's not, and there's something they've been victimized some way, shape, or form in their life. I believe to get to that position, because that's not what people want to be. I mean, there are some prostitutes that think otherwise. That they think that they should be allowed to do that. That it, but. I, 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 I think that it's, we, we have to change the mindset of people, like the lot lizards thing, not <laughs> like bashing your family, but, but they say that and, um, you know, because we think, oh, they're just prostitutes. Well, they are 13 and 14 year old girls being sold multiple times a night. You know, put yourself in the shoes of a 13 or 14 year old girl doing that, how scared they must be, and we are just like, oh, they're just going to be prostitutes. You know, we have to change the mindset of people. We have to educate them. We have to change their mindset that that, that, that girl matters. I don't care if she's 45. She matters. She's not just a prostitute. She's there for some reason. You know, and she matters. Supported by somebody. She matters. Yeah. At the last at the last conference, I remember, and I believe it was this lady we're going to listen to next. She said, "They are not prostitutes. They are being prostituted." Yeah. Absolutely. There's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. there is. Yeah. Yeah, some of the, the at one of the conferences I went to last year, they said refer to as victims and perpetrators, not pimps. Yeah, uh, pimps are cool. Pimps are cool. You know, we still have Halloween costumes. They're Halloween, yeah, Halloween costumes. <laughs> for it's cool. You know, it's cool to be a pimp, I guess. But um, yeah, so we have to change that. Why, why are you dressing like that? Why do you think that's funny and cool? It's not. Yeah. What was the um, what was that movie? The, it's hard out here for a pimp. Was the song that won the Oscar that year for best song? I can't remember what movie it came from. Hustle and Flow, I think. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. It's hard out here for a pimp was like the Oscar winning song. Yeah, it's glorifying it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> Hollywood mm -hmm. in our music yeah. genre. Yeah. Anaconda by Nicki Minaj. I about fell out of my chair when I read the lyrics. Oh my god! I was like, and my kids are singing it because you know you're not paying any attention. And I'm like, did she just say that out loud? Like, then I look and I'm like, oh my gosh, my nine-year-old singing this. Oh my gosh, you know. And like I turn it every time it comes on now, but yeah, because you just listen to it on the radio, you're not paying attention, and you don't think they would allow them to say those things. And I'm, oh god, it's horrible. You should look at the lyrics to that. It's bad. Yeah. So bad. It is. It is. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you thinking? And the video is just, I mean, I'm just embarrassed. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, why? It's, it's, it's really horrible. Yeah. But there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of factors that play into trafficking that we have to look at, too. There's a peeling the onion, you know? Mm -hmm. Exploitation of women and exploitation in Hollywood and stuff like that. It's huge. What time are we supposed to be done at? Yeah. What time? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Anybody ready to ask any questions? Questions? Okay. <laughs> if anyone wants to um, give me your email address, I will be happy to send you this PowerPoint. And oh, you're passing it around. Oh, that's just your. Okay. You can pass it around and just get a bunch more. Sure. Okay. Okay.